Working Cows Podcast, Episode 16. Welcome to the podcast that gives producers a platform to discuss and share paradigm-challenging practices. Practices that have increased the effectiveness of their operation and the joy that their families have received from this lifestyle. This episode has been brought to you in part by Kamac Ranch Supply. Check out their website at kamacranchsupply.com. This episode is also brought to you by chriswilliamsaudio.com. Head on over to chriswilliamsaudio.com for all your audio production needs. Howdy, everybody. Pretty excited about today's episode. This is an episode with Jim Falstick from the South Dakota Grassland Coalition. Jim is the director of the Grassland Coalition and a producer from Highmore, South Dakota. We're going to talk today about the South Dakota Grassland Coalition's Grassland Planner, an excellent resource that they put out every year. It looks a lot like a calendar, but there's so much more going on to that. So we're going to dive into this conversation with Jim Falstick from Highmore, South Dakota, director of the South Dakota Grassland Coalition. Jim, thanks for joining me today on the Working Cows podcast. I'd like to give you an opportunity to uh, introduce yourself just a little bit to the people out there listening. Uh, If you would just kind of tell us about yourself and your involvement in the the beef industry, the ranching industry. Well, thank you, Clay. Um, I'm from Highmore, South Dakota. Uh, we have a, a family operation. Uh, my wife, daughter, son-in-law, their family. Uh, uh, we have one employee that helps us as well, but a, a quite diverse operation. Uh, cow-calf is our mainstay, but we do have um, a number of enterprises we're involved in. We we think diversity is really important, and whether it's in our our grasslands or enterprises or or our farming practices, we think that's all important. So, like I said, cow calf is uh, our mainstay, but we also custom graze yearlings in the summertime uh, if we have grass. Last year, we we chose not to do that, and. That's one of the nice things about the yearling side of things is the flexibility of it. We don't have to do it. Uh, so that's been really nice. I've I've been here in this area all my life, um, grew up on this particular place and bought it from my parents in 1973. So been around a career or two already. Very good. Thank you. Um, so you're talking about custom grazing some yearlings. That's your kind of your destock strategy when it comes to a drought situation? Yeah, it is. And even in, rather than us to go out and buy them and, and put further risk in, into it, uh, we use it as, that, uh, as you refer to, safety valve, uh, so that we can destock. The, the agreement we have with people that we graze yearlings for is that with a two-week notice, uh, we can send those cattle home or to a feedlot or wherever they want to go with them. We're, we're very uh, upfront with that uh, right from the get-go. We don't want it to be a surprise for the owner of the cattle. We don't want to have it be a surprise on our end. And, and last year, as dry as we were in the spring and uh, kind of headed that way again this year, uh, we, we give the owner notice the middle of April that that we, in fact, weren't going to graze any custom yearlings last year. And, I, and I'd, I'd kind of give him a heads up before that that it didn't look good, but uh, it was kind of the final notice, the middle of April. And we may, in fact, do that again this year, but it's, it's really uh, nice to have that safety valve to where uh, you can protect yourself and end up not abusing the resource by overgrazing, uh, not run yourself short of feed and and be able to keep that that factory on the place uh, in in the stability of the cow calf side of things sure how do you treat that land that isn't getting grazed by a yearling 
when, you know, say you're not having a yearling come in in the spring and through the summer, how are you handling that resource that isn't being grazed by those yearlings? Well, I'll, I'll back up to why uh, another reason for the yearlings and and of course in our particular area we've got a number of different invading grasses uh, going into our native grass uh, and I'm referring to things like crested wheat grass brome grass is the one that's uh, kind of my nightmare uh, it seems like it's just taking over the countryside so we use the yearlings to try to depress uh, some excessive growth on the wet years of things like brown grass, crested wheat grass, some years sweet clover. And and so the years that we don't do that, we probably aren't having a big production on those invaders. And, and we just ha- uh, keep our cows in a particular pasture less length of time uh, because production's down uh, across the board. And so we just move the cows faster and still utilize those pastures but one of the things we do and and it's a part of our drought plan is to uh, well and and one of our goals uh, would be the good starting point is to have a year's worth of forage on the operation at all times so it don't bother us uh, if we end up having a pasture or two or more that do not get grazed in the in during the growing season uh We consider that much like money in the bank uh, for lean years like we're going through in the commodity prices this year as as well as on the moisture side. uh, Just just makes our operation so much more stable and sustainable uh, by having that reserve. And when I say a year's worth of forage, it's kind of a combination of things, whether it's a uh, we have three hay sheds. Uh, one of our other goals is to not feed cattle during the winter time. We prefer to graze them, but we also know that don't happen sometimes because of ice like last year or snow or whatever. And so we do have three hay sheds that we try to keep full of hay and, and don't use them. Uh, we've got hay in, in a couple of those sheds that go back uh, probably 10 years. And uh, it looks mighty good on a year like this, and, and sure, your vitamins may not be as good and stuff, but uh, we're feeding the cattle that we are feeding right now some fairly old hay, and they're just doing excellent. So it's uh, it's all part of, of building that reserve, whether it's stockpiled forage, uh, hay in the shed, or a part of our drought plan as we start looking at our, our moisture for the year, the fall before, uh, basically in October, and, and it's not good. Uh, we were extremely dry in October, uh, still are extremely dry, and I, I don't like the weather cycle. It's not indicating it wants to change, and hopefully it does before April. Sure. So when it comes to grazing uh, brome grass and, and sweet clover and crested wheat and some of the other things that you guys are dealing with there, is that a forage variety that the yearling or the cow will naturally go after or do you have to do you have to force them onto those those resources somewhat well again that's where the yearlings are a nice fit so we can really increase our stocking rates uh, and again variable uh, numbers uh, depends on how how wet it is or if we're having that sweet clover flush or whatever we can take more yearlings some years than others or none at all as I've already mentioned but the nice thing about it is all of those different forages that I've mentioned are really good in, uh, say, May and June. And uh, by August, uh, typically they have about the quality of straw as far as uh, nutritional value. So, uh, again, it works really nice to have those yearlings uh, get out there, utilize uh, those invaders when, when the nutrient value is good. And it's they're excellent feed. Um, I just don't want the whole countryside to to be any of those that we've talked about. And uh, so we try to utilize them. One of, again, I talk about goals, and you'll hear me talk about it a lot. One of our goals is to not let any brome grass go to seed on the place. We don't want it to propagate, uh, but it is excellent forage if you can use it early. Very helpful. Um, well, and as much as I would 
love to sit here and talk about grazing all day and, and different strategies that you guys are employing, uh, specifically the, uh, the figuring your, your production based on the moisture and the rainfall. That's, I think, a very uh, critical tool in this whole thing, but I think that discussion might have to wait for another time because what we're here to talk about today is the South Dakota Grassland Coalition. Could you give us a little bit of an introduction to the Grassland Coalition? Sure. Uh, The South Dakota Grassland Coalition was started in uh, 1998, uh, an offshoot of the national uh, GLCI program that was funded through the Farm Bill back in 95, I believe it was, to help each state start a a grassroots uh, grassland uh, organization to help promote and and uh, make producers of, of grasslands and utilization of grasslands more profitable and and higher quality so that was that was how it kind of got initiated uh, there was some folks in South Dakota uh, with NRCS was kind of a driving force in helping get that started uh, the state rangeland specialists were very helpful in getting that started up and so that's kind of briefly where and how it started and and it's made up of a board of nine producers uh, we're all producers uh, uh, very concerned about grassland resource I, I would say uh, even though we're concerned with the environment we don't consider ourselves environmentalists as such uh, uh, we're just concerned that that it's important and, and a number of us have farm ground as well it's it's not that we're brainwashed grass guys or anything but we see it being very important we see uh, in a number of ways i mean whether you talk water quality uh wildlife i mean boy the the emphasis that uh, things like lack of pheasant numbers um, different birds i guess you could throw the monarch butterfly in there just a number of species that rely on grasslands the pollinators and uh I'm sure you've heard uh, the research that shows the percentage of uh, human food that relies on pollination. And so these are all very serious in in the big picture as far as us surviving um, in this country. And so there's a, a number of reasons why grasslands are important. And obviously it needs to be economically viable for the producers. So this group uh, specializes, if you will, in, in promoting educational events, uh, uh, technical assistance. So we try to help people get that, and not, not that we're technical experts, but we try to provide those avenues, whether it's through NRCS or some of the wildlife groups that have a specialist and biologist on board that can help when it comes to doing a better job and and taking the the big picture look at what's going on in the landscape and the importance of grasslands and and the role they play in agriculture as well as so many other things so water quality quantity uh, we continue to see these extremes in the weather that a lot of it centers around water either too much or too little and uh what we're doing on the landscape to manage water and and the species that are growing out there are just huge in, in all of that. Sure. I think a lot of times producers in the past have been tempted to look at wildlife as a competitor for the grassland. Do you see that as the case or do you see it as more of a uh, we have to learn to coexist with these and, and they're actually beneficial in some ways? Or how do you How do you look at that? Well, there's there's a def, a number of different aspects of of that question, and and number one, I think uh, wildlife's a real indicator of what we're doing on the land as as uh, individual producers and as a uh, business uh, of being in agriculture. Uh, I think wildlife's a real reflector of what we're doing on the landscape. Uh, one of the things we learned early on was how important birds are as an indicator. And and I get it. Uh, I understand uh, too much of a, of a species causes damage, uh, et cetera. And I think, I think uh, 
that's kind of a reflection of balance too. Obviously, if if uh, you're doing good things on the land, you have an attractive place for wildlife. Uh, you're going to tend to draw it in from other areas, and I don't care whether it's deer or pheasants or waterfowl. It don't matter if you're doing a good good job on the land. You're going to have more wildlife, but it's an indicator of what you're doing right. And while you're you're making it more attractive for wildlife, you're probably also making it more attractive as far as uh, air pollution, uh, water quality, uh, controlling flooding, and the list goes on and on. So. So we, we learned a long time ago the, the importance of birds uh, as an indicator of that. And uh, you're exactly right. Uh, back in the 80s when we uh, figured out we had to change our approach to agriculture because we were going broke uh, between the weather and the economy and, and much like things are now, uh, the only difference is we had really high interest back in those days, and, and that's not the case now. But when I look at the, the stress that agriculture is under right now, I see a lot of similarities. And we knew we had to change. That's all there was to it, or we were going to finish going broke. We were already well on the way. When, when we changed our philosophy to our priority being natural resources, all of a sudden uh, our wildlife numbers did start increasing. Uh, we were having extreme damage from uh, especially pheasants and deer on our, on our crops, not so much on the grasslands, but on the crops, rather than say, well, boy, we, we need to get rid of all that stuff. It's a bad thing. Uh, I guess we aren't doing a good job on the landscape. We chose to to make lemonade out of lemons and uh, actually started a couple hunting enterprises. And so there we go, uh, capitalizing on diversity again and uh, had the daughter and son-in-law coming back into the operation. So we had a little more labor and uh, we were able to start a couple hunting enterprises. That um, It's unbelievable the, the demand and interest for those kind of services and uh, it's really helped stabilize our operation both economically and from a drought standpoint. Again, we, we've really learned uh, to make the best of droughts, I guess. Sure, very much. Well, that's really helpful information. As I was listening to you, I was thinking about how, you know, I've been trained to look for indicator species in a grass, you know, but you also get some indicator species from the wildlife, and, and they can be... Uh, kind of a, a thermometer or a barometer, if you will, that, hey, I'm doing something right here with how I'm managing this grass resource because they want to be here. And while they're here, I'm also going to take some benefit from them. So that was very good. Th what we're going to do now is take a quick break and thank our sponsors. And then we're going to come back from that break and talk a little bit more about a new resource that has been put out by the South Dakota Grassland Coalition that has some really helpful things in it and an accompanying video series. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. This episode has been brought to you by Kamak Ranch Supply. Check out their website at kamakranchsupply.com. Here's the deal about Kamak Ranch Supply. When you call and ask them about a product, there's no blank pause on the other end of the line because they don't understand the product that you just asked them about. If they are selling it, they understand it because they are producers, and Gary Kamak himself, the owner of Kamak Ranch Supply, is a producer. So if you want answers about the products you're calling to ask about from producers, call Kamak Ranch Supply or check out their website at kamakranchsupply.com. All right, we're back with Jim Falstick from Highmore, South Dakota. We're talking about uh, his operation and the Grassland Coalition, of which he is a part. What is your role, Jim, with the Grassland Coalition? Well, I'm I'm actually chairman of the board. Uh, I've I've been on the coalition about as long as a board member as anybody has, I guess. I I, I consider it. Uh, a real blessing to have had the, the privilege to lead this group. Uh, just a superb group, whether it's board members or partners, uh, members, it don't matter. And it's been a real honor to have the privilege to be chairman uh, and be in that leadership role. And I have to tell you, just because I'm chairman by no means, uh, does that mean that I'm the, the kingpin or, or the most important? We got a, a passionate group of directors that are very dedicated. There, there isn't a one of them that get paid a cent for the things they do as far as uh, 
going to board meetings or leading the charge uh, at, at different meetings or reaching out for different uh, events, just dedicated as can be. And like I said, it's just been a real honor to be in a leadership position with this group. I can say from experience, it is a great group. Uh, we had Dave Olala on uh, episode four of the Working Cows podcast, and uh, the, just some of the great resources that they've been doing, not only the classes and the events that they put on, uh, like the grazing or the grass schools and, and different things like that, but this new resource that you guys just recently put out, and I think, th- is this the second year of the calendar or the planner? Well, it's actually more than that, and I, I want to back up just a little bit there. You mentioned Dave Olala and, and, and him being on one of your uh, podcasts and, and our partners. Uh, you know, the, I always say the key word coalition. Our partners, whether it's Extension or NRCS or just a whole gamut of, of different ag groups and conservation groups that, that are here in support of we we don't have any funding, you know. It's not like we have a checkoff uh, on grass or anything. We have to go out and raise the funding or reach out to our partners for funding. And boy, you talk about support in in all sorts of different ways. And and you're mentioning a, a Dave being on is a classic example. So I, I wanted to go back and pile on that first but uh in regards to the planner which is what we're really supposed to be visiting about today uh, i believe we're on our sixth one uh and it's interesting how that's transitioned uh, started out as as kind of a dream and a hope and and not really knowing how well it was going to be received and again thanks to our partners for making this happen uh NRCS has been very helpful, not only from a, a technical standpoint, but a financial standpoint, and has been kind of the lead organization on this. So that's kind of our, our main partner. But I believe this is the sixth year, and it's uh, transitioned. And and I was trying to think back as, as I was uh, thinking about our conversation I think we maybe had a couple thousand printed the first year, and we thought, boy, that's that's getting kind of carried away. We'll throw half of those away, but we did get them spread around through uh, different uh, locations, uh, thanks to groups like uh, conservation districts and our and our conservation partners. We got got them spread around pretty good, and that's grown to where this year we had fourteen thousand five hundred printed. Uh, so it has been well received, and and different groups uh, um, send those out to some of their partners as well, and so it's and it, it goes out through a couple different uh, publications uh, statewide. So I'm I'm sure a number of your listeners have seen them. Uh, most people would refer to them as a calendar, and it's it's that, but it's much more and. And there's room enough on there and critical dates and critical uh, events. And and so it is a planner, uh, but it's also a calendar. And, and it's uh, been really fun to be uh, involved in, again, one of these projects that uh, the coalition has gotten behind and, and it's really expanded. It is a very neat resource. Uh, you know, it's got everything in there from dates where you're going to want to start looking for the emergence of certain or the growth, the rapid growth period of certain grass indicator species. And and I, I think even some like mating seasons or different uh, times when different birds are going to start showing up and, and being really active and, and some of those things that we've already talked about as these are indications that you're doing something right on your place and, and that you can use these key dates to manage more uh, effectively the resources that you have. Is that kind of an accurate assessment of what what you guys are hoping to do with that planner? It sure is, and and we keep adding new little twists to it each year. And uh, but but probably the the big feature is the fact of of the fact that we do feature a, a different grass based operation in South Dakota each month. So to me, that's the exciting part is is the featuring of of different operations. You know. Uh, Early on, I think everybody that's on the board was featured at one time or another on on one of those months. But it's transformed into a a planner that 
not only tries to get different operations each year, but we pick out a theme for the whole year uh, and try to base it on that. Uh, so each year we try to make it bigger and better. I guess there's a limit to what you can do when you got 30, 31 days to work with on a, on a month, but we do try to uh, keep adding to it. One of the the big additions for 17 and it's just starting to come out now because it was it was done in 17 but now it's coming out as the 18 planner is each one of those individual operations that was featured for the month we also recruited enough of our partners to come up with enough funds so that we could do a video of each operation that's going to be featured uh, the January one uh, featuring Cody Jorgensen and the Jorgensen Land and Cattle Company down at Ideal just came out. Be looking for it if you haven't seen it already. A really well done video. The videographers that we hired to do these 12 different issues, uh, I mean, he, he takes this really serious. He has a drone. Uh, he put on over 20,000 miles in South Dakota filming these different operations throughout the year. He, uh, he does professional advertising and videography work for some real major uh, industry businesses uh, also through the year. So we're really lucky to have his expertise. Uh, he also does the Leopold Award videos is how we got started with him. And so we, uh, we're pretty proud of the work he does. And along with those videos, there's also a number of still pictures that are taken along with it. Um, and, an, and another new feature for this year, uh, we also, uh, through his business, have uh, hired a writer to do two different articles on each each operation, one more producer orientated and and one of the things that we're trying to place more emphasis on is reaching out to the urban public and consumer and so one of the articles will be pointed towards them as well so we we think uh yeah it costs a lot of money i i feel comfortable that our partners think it's been a good investment and will continue to it's doing great things as far as outreach and and telling the story of of people doing good things on the land I can speak from experience. The video that was shot for the Jorgensen Land and Cattle Partnership is very, very well done and uh, very well communicates kind of everything that we are trying to do as producers to show people that we are here for the benefit of these animals. We're here for the benefit of the land. We're here for the benefit of the of the consumer, you know, the end consumer. We're trying to get them the most high quality product that we can in the way that is best for both the land and the animals. This uh, podcast is going to be Working Cows episode number 16, workingcows.net slash 16. You can find links to all those things, the the video that uh, Jim mentioned, the articles that Jim mentioned will all be linked there, workingcows.net slash 16. And it is our hope to have an opportunity to sit down with as, as many of those producers that are being featured on each month of the calendar as possible and in the videos, we want to sit down with as many of them as we possibly can and feature in a little bit more in-depth way what they're doing on their place to benefit the land, the consumer, and the cattle. So I want to back up and ask just one follow-up question. Uh, what, would you, what do you mean by grass-based producer? Well, uh, it can mean a lot of different things, and, and we try to, I mean, obviously, uh, the beef industry is near and dear to me, uh, uh, but we try to be more open-minded and broad-based than that. If you uh, look at the, all the months in the uh, planner clay, I believe this year there's two, uh, two buffalo operations that were featured. I lose track of what's in which upper which which calendar year, but I I know in the in the last year, and I believe it was in 17. Maybe it's coming in 18. There's a sheep operation featured. Uh, of course, we've already talked about the importance of wildlife and water quality, and the list goes on and on. But but when I when I talk about grass based, I don't want to get specific and say, uh, well, it's all about the cattle industry or it's all about wildlife or it's all about anything. 
but it is based on the importance of grasslands in the ecosystem and on the landscape and, and the importance it, it plays to South Dakota and, and its economy. Is there anything else that you wanted to talk about or you were hoping to cover today as far as the, the planner or the video series or any of those things, the Grassland Coalition? No, I I don't think so. I I really appreciate the privilege to visit with you about it. Obviously, we could go on for a considerable time, but I, I, I know uh, there's a limit to the amount of time you have. Hopefully, uh, this has generated uh, potential for, for visits on other topics and uh, with other producers and especially the folks that are featured on these planners uh, each month. So just really appreciate the fact that you're part of that picture of outreach and, and helping spread the word. So really want to thank you. Well, it's a privilege for me too. It really is. And and just to producers are some of my favorite people in the world. And I, I myself on a limited scale have kind of dipped my toe this year into that uh, producer world and, and hope to continue to get more involved on in that. Um, but it's just such a neat thing. You know, we went to the Dave Pratt seminar that was sponsored by the South Dakota Grassland Coalition and the World Wildlife Fund or Federation World Wildlife Fund. And, you know, they they had the plow print uh, resource there that shows basically that the the Northern Great Plains acts as a as a set of kidneys <laughs> is how they put it in there for the land or for the air and the water quality. And that basically it's just a, a massive filtration and, and for that big filtration system to work most efficiently, we've got to partner with, with nature and we've got to manage our, our cows in such a way that they are impacting the ground in a positive way. And, and that's just exactly what we are all about here at the working cows podcast. We want to put cows to work in the way that is most profitable for us, for our end consumer, and ultimately, I would say, for the land itself. Well, I think that's a very good description. Well, thank you for your time today, Jim. I really appreciate it, and I look forward to, as you said, uh, connecting further with you and with other producers around South Dakota. One last question. Does the does the planner go outside of South Dakota? Do you see it being u- utilized by producers outside of South Dakota? You know, I'm I'm sure to a limited extent, and I I know there's other groups and states that are looking at it as as kind of a pattern, if you will, for for something they may be able to do in other states, and that's great. Uh, we we take pride in in setting the pace for new ideas and accomplishments, and. And it's not just about South Dakota. Uh, so if we can if we can be helpful in the whole Northern Great Plains or the whole United States, it like, just makes our role that much more interesting and worthwhile. So. Yep. And if anybody wants to get in touch with the South Dakota Grassland Coalition, links to how to do that will be at workingcows.net slash 16. Go to workingcows.net slash 16 and you can uh, find the South Dakota Grassland Coalition there and look at some of the resources that they are producing. And if you're in a state that you are in a place of influence where you want to see something like this happen, I can probably say uh, with a great deal of confidence that the South Dakota Grassland Coalition would be happy to help see that happen in your state as well. Give you some of the ideas that they have uh, or roadblocks, help you navigate some of the roadblocks that they've already been through. And and if I could add, Clay, if we've uh, piqued anybody's interest within or without a South Dakota in, in what this planner amounts to and what it's like, uh, uh, feel free to contact us uh, and, and reach out to any of the directors or any of our executive uh, employees, and we'd be more than glad to send one to you. And you can find that information by going to sdgrass.org. SD Grass is in South Dakota Grass, so sdgrass.org. Check out that website and, and get in touch with them. And uh, thank you, Jim, for your time. I appreciate it. You bet. Thank you, Clay. This episode has been brought to you by Chris Williams Audio. Check out his website at chriswilliamsaudio.com. For the last 11 years or so, I've been talking for a living. I've gained some skills in talking. I can form a sentence. I can think on my feet. I can respond to questions. I can come up with new questions. All that time developing my speaking craft has not left me a lot of time to figure out how to make audio sound great. If you're a musician, 
podcaster or filmmaker, making your product sound great is crucial. So you stick to what you know and let Chris Williams stick to what he knows, making your product sound great. Head on over to chriswilliamsaudio.com for all your podcasting, music production, and film audio needs. I'm really excited about this series of episodes that is going to be a partnership with the South Dakota Grassland Coalition to interview each one of their featured members for each month in 2018 and look forward to releasing these episodes as close to the release of those videos that they are producing in the coming months. Next week, we have a mind-stretching episode with Bob Kenford talking about instinctive migratory grazing. So please tune in next week for episode 17 of the Working Cows podcast. We invite you to visit workingcows.net to subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher. You'll also find detailed show notes pages, resources from our guests, and the industry leaders who have influenced them. For more ideas on putting your cows to work for you in a more profitable way, tune in next week.